So I want to thank everybody who served and worked last weekend. You know, one of the things about working together is so many people get to know other people by doing that, and we had that happen last week, and I just, I just love that when people serve, and especially when you serve for the right reasons. We're going to talk about this idea of genuine faith today versus plastic faith, and I'm going to give you a few analogies that I hope will make sense to you. Um, here's the series verse, James 2.26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And what we're going to talk about today is this idea of traits of genuine faith. Traits of genuine faith. What does genuine faith look like? Now, we've all been around people. There's, there's two major extremes uh, that we've seen. One is the plastic church people. You know what I'm talking about? How you doing? Good to see you all. Oh, so good to see you. And then you see them somewhere else and they're nothing like that. Or the grumpy church person who's just grumpy all the time. They're angry like somebody yelled at them on Sunday and then they went home and yelled at everybody else and it's like Pollyanna. And, and you know, they're just mad, you know, because God wants something and they don't know what it is. So they're just going to yell at everybody. And you don't have to be either of those people. I'll never forget years ago when I was in college, fairly new in my faith. Um, a church called me, a friend, good friend was uh, playing keyboards for them, and uh, they had the drummer who was the original drummer for the Scorpions. I don't know if you know who that band is, but right before the Scorpions became famous, that drummer got up in one of their band meetings and said, you guys stink, I'm forming my own band, and left the band, and less than a year later, they were all multi-billionaires traveling. So he used to tell that story every day. And so, but he was out of town, so they called me to come in and replace the former drummer from the Scorpions. So I went in, and I'll never forget, when I came into this band practice, these people gathered in a circle. First thing they did, they prayed. We prayed for 20 minutes. It was so, they called each other brother and sister and amened each other and encouraged each other. And I thought, this is the neatest group of Christians I have ever been. I was just I was blown away. I thought, this is the kind of faith I want. And I'll never forget, we literally finished the meeting. It was an awesome meeting. And I thought, that was just powerful. That's life-changing. And we walked into the parking lot. And they invited me to go drinking with them. And they began cussing and smoking. And suddenly, the way they talked to each other was totally different. And I went, what? Tracky say, what? Scooby-Doo? Right? I, I was just like, what is this? And what it was is an act, a show, pretend to impress the people that were around, and then this is who we really are. Listen, I want to encourage you, and James, early on in Christianity, this is the first book written in the New Testament, uh, probably 10 to 15 years after uh, Jesus leaves earth alive, by the way. This is Jesus' uh, brother. I know half-brother, but brother. And, uh, you know, he at first didn't believe in Jesus. And at this point, he's telling the early church in Jerusalem, hey, here's the deal. If your faith is real, this is what it's going to look like. And he wasn't saying that works save you. And we're going to get to that. But here's the deal. Listen, too many of us, one of the reasons we're fake it's because we don't recognize the acceptance that Christ gives us when we put our faith in Him. We don't realize that we're fully accepted, and so we have one of two extremes. We either just don't do anything, we don't really uh, have that faith, or we try to fake it. If we really don't have God's power, we think, well, if I do a bunch of stuff, then maybe God will be happy with me. And one of the ways you can know this is if on the days you mess up, you feel like God in heaven goes, ah. And on the days you think you've done something good, you feel like God's going, way to go. Or you even start to feel like, you know, those people should be spiritual like me. Because, you know, I got my act together. And as we look at these verses, we realize today that it's not about us. And I hope by faith you'll be able to grab hold of this acceptance by God. Because what will happen is, as you understand how much God accepts and loves you, even if you were the prodigal son that came home, he pours out his love on you, and that so fills you that it changes not only how you understand faith, but how faith overflows from you. 
how love overflows from you, how fruit becomes natural. So here's three things. Number one, words match works. So it's not just what people say, it's what they do. So the way they talk on Sunday is the way they live on Monday. If there's a disconnect between what you pretend to say on, uh, did I say pretend? What you say on Sunday and how you live on Monday, then somehow something's missing. So let's see what James says about that. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith? You notice he says claims, because what's he saying? They don't really have faith. What if somebody claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? And then he says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed. You know, this is like when the pastor says, can I get you to help in the nursery? And you say, I'll pray about it. You know what the pastor knows that means, right? Nope. Right? We know that. We've, we've been around long enough to know that you didn't really need to pray about it. You just were trying to push me away by saying something spiritual so that you could pretend that you were making a spiritual decision. Now, I'm not telling you not to pray about things. I just know that most of the time when people tell me they'll pray about something, <clears throat> that's not really what they mean. Correct? You know what I'm saying? Wouldn't it be great if you just had thought bubbles above your head? No, it would not. It would not. Because some of you right now would be like bacon. Okay? So... Then it continues, but he does nothing about their physical needs. So what he's saying is, that person is saying, oh, I hope you get fed. But they're not really doing anything about it. You, you're, you're saying the right things, but you don't really mean it. What good is it? In the same way, faith itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. I love what Calvin said. He said, faith alone saves. But the faith that saves is not alone. Another way to think about it is this. Faith is the root of salvation. So you think about a tree. Faith is the root. Okay? And works are the fruit. So let me, let me just give you an example. I've got this wonderful poor plant that has been attacked by me several times. Now this plant has been here for at least three years. Maybe 30. We don't know. It looks... Other than the dust added to it, it looks exactly like it did three years ago. Correct? Now, what happens if you take a fake plant and you trim it? What happens to the plant? Wait, let me try that again just to mess with you guys, right? What happens if I trim this plant? Right? How many people think that's going to grow back? No, it's not. Why? Because it's fake. And let me tell you what happens to, to people who call themselves Christians but just are playing a game called religion. And they're coming and trying to earn their way to God. They're putting fake fruit on and being, Plastic, how you doing? Uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, uh, I don't really mean this, but I'm pretending. When God prunes them, you know what's left? Nothing. So when they go through trials and when they go through struggles and when they go through pain and they're trimmed, all of a sudden there's nothing left. And they go, well, I tried Christianity. No, you didn't. You tried religion. You tried to do good works thinking it was real. Now, let me tell you something about real plants. At home, I have a hedge. I got rose bushes. Did you know when you trim a real plant, when you cut the top of it, did you know there's actually a signal that's being sent that says, go forward, go forward, go forward, move ahead, try to protect it, it's not too late. It says all that. Did you catch that? Just wanted to make sure. Right? When that is, is taken off, all of a sudden a different signal goes to the plant and it says, go out. So when you trim the top of a plant... It then goes the other way. It's programmed in it. It's almost like there's this divine design. And Jesus over and over talks about how God's the gardener and he's pruning. You, you get it? What's he doing when you go through trial? When you go through struggle? When things don't go the way you want them to? By the way, a lot of things don't go the way I want them to. This morning, you know what I got to do this morning? I take my shower, ready for church. And I got to go and get my septic snake out and snake out my septic tank. I've already had two showers today, I just want to point out. And you should thank me for the second one. Thank you, yeah. Is that what I wanted to do? No. But I have a choice at that point. God's teaching me, okay, are you going to have a bad attitude now because you had to do something you wanted, didn't want to do? 
No, I'm learning. What's that going to profit me to get mad at the septic tank? What's it going to profit me to throw the tools? I, mean, I used to work for a guy who threw tools. What does it profit him? He has to buy new tools, maybe. And so what does God do in your life? He trims. And so many times, anything that's in your life that's not real, where you're pretending, God will use trial and struggle and difficulty, what? To get that off of you so that real fruit can grow. So that you can be full of patience and love and peace, all the fruits of the Spirit when you're the real thing. But if you're just trying to fake it, you're going to be exhausted because anytime you get trimmed, you're going to have less and less fruit and you're going to have to just keep pretending and, and you're going to have a nervous breakdown one day. Or you're just going to say, that church thing didn't work, I'm not going anymore. Why? Because you weren't doing the real thing. So what does that look like? Listen to what Jesus said about fake people. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. So basically, they try to look like somebody who's spiritual, who has their act together. They pretend, and then it says, but inwardly, they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do they say the right thing and give money and do good things, but then they attack other churches? They go after other Christians. They attack people. They belittle people. They talk down about everybody else. What's the fruit of their life? And then it continues. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? That's supposed to be an easy question. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Hey, this week a TV star was arrested who called himself a Christian. It's not the first time here in the last couple of years. There's been some pretty famous pastors who've been arrested and thrown in jail or things have been found out about them and they lost all their credibility. Can I tell you something? The people close to them did not go. Never saw that coming. The people close to them saw the fruit. See, if you're just watching on TV or you just see me on Sunday morning, you don't know what really goes on. Let me tell you who knows. Rodney, who's sitting in staff meeting with me on Tuesday and sees me say something and then go, oh, that's not what I, I'm really sorry. Yeah. He gets to see what the real deal is. There are pastors right now, I am certain, that are very famous, and you probably love them, who are screaming at staff members and controlling and manipulating and getting up on Sundays going, let me tell you about God's word today. And God says, when they get to heaven, he's going to say, I don't know you, but I did miracles in your name. No, no, you did that for you. See, the good news about God, like I said last week, is that he knows our heart. And the bad news is, he knows our heart. So he knows when we're plastic. By the way, we're not even good at judging this. I have a good friend. He's a good friend. He's the nicest person on earth. And I promise you, when you meet him, you'd be like, I think he's fake. Because he literally is the nicest person on earth. When you meet him, he does this. That's, that's how he looks. I've known him for almost 40 years. So it's hard for us sometimes to even judge whether the fruit's real. But we look at the fruit, not just what they do outwardly. Look at your own life. What's really going on beneath the surface? Number two, knowing leads to doing. So some will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. What's he saying? He's saying, if I've got real faith, it's naturally going to flow out of my hands. You believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. It's not just believing something. It's not just a head knowledge. Faith is not just knowing about something. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Even demons believe and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says... Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. What happened? In, in Hebrews 11, we know that Abraham so believed God that he knew that even if he sacrificed his son, that he would rise again from the dead. That's how much he trusted God. His faith caused his actions. Now, Abraham didn't always have that faith. Abraham did some dumb things. Guess what? 
So do we. But when we act on faith and we trust God, the fruit of faith overflows. Listen. If I said to you, turn on this light bulb, unless this is a magic light bulb where you push a button, you seen those? Unless this is one of the, if this is a regular light bulb, guess what? It's got to be plugged into the power, right? For it to work. If you try to live the Christian life on your own without plugging into God's power, you are going to be exhausted. You're going to be continually try to do works based on your flesh, and your flesh can't do it. But when you trust God and allow Him to work in your life and bring the power and the fruit of the Spirit through His Holy Spirit, guess what's happened? It becomes natural. If I take this and put it in a light socket and turn it on, guess what's going to happen? Unless something's wrong with the bulb, blink, it comes on. We're the same way. Now, I will say that sometimes even as believers, we originally put our faith in Christ, but then we get a little off track, right? We get a little unscrewed. (laughs) We have a screw loose, I've been told, right? So what do we do? We go back to spending time with God. We go back to spending time in God's Word. By the way, if your life is unstable and everybody goes through storms, God's Word is the anchor. When we go to God's Word and we trust the anchor of Jesus as we read His Word, it anchors us back to the truth. So even if everything else, we don't get what I want. The doctor tells me something I didn't want to hear. Something happens to somebody that I don't like. I'm dealing with a situation I don't like. That person's driving me crazy. That I'm worried about that family member. All that stuff that seems topsy-turvy. When that happens, spend time in God's Word and let Jesus be the anchor for your soul. In Galatians 6, it says this, let us not become weary in doing good. This is a first century church. They get tired sometimes. And then it says, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. Dead things don't reap a harvest. We will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I love that. It's like, Do good to everybody, but especially those people that drive you crazy sometimes that you're close to. Listen, if you're a part of a church and you get to know people, can I tell you something about people? They will always disappoint you at some point. And so you have to go out of your way to give them grace and do good to people when you see, oh, that's a bad limb on that tree. By the way, we're all still getting pruned. Anybody have a a bad limb on their tree? God's working on you, and you realize, oh, I still struggle with my driving. I still struggle with being patient when people do this certain thing. I still struggle with this one child in my family. I still struggle with this one relative that comes over at Thanksgiving, and I just can't get them to be quiet. This is the mute button. Looking for it, right? And God says, we got to trim that. we got to work on that. You allow him to work on that, what? By getting close to other believers. People say to me every once in a while, you know, Satan's in the choir. I've always noticed that choirs fight more than anybody else in the church. It's true. They do. Absolutely. That is absolutely true. You know why? Because they know each other better than anybody else in the church. You know who spends more time together than anybody else? The musicians. And they, and they have to work on something together. You can go to small group and just sit there and look at people. But, it, but if you're in a, in a band, in a group, in a praise team, and you've got to work together, guess what? All of your bad branches show up at some point. That day you're tired and grumpy and you come into practice and you say something you didn't mean to say, or you meant to say it, maybe worse, right? You've got to have forgiveness. You've got to have grace. Do good to those, especially those in the believe, that are believers. I love that. I love that. Number three. So we've got words match works. Knowing leads to doing. And then grace through faith will bring works. A couple weeks ago, I was driving to church. I got a sunroof. I love sunroofs. Now, in Florida, maybe you shouldn't. I don't know. Maybe I'm silly. But I, I, I had the sunroof open, had the windows down a little bit because it wasn't 1,000 degrees outside yet. 
And as I'm driving here, all of a sudden I smelled something I have not smelled in years. I knew that smell. I said, oh, that's amazing. Somebody had planted about a year and a half ago some brand new orange trees, a whole, a whole flock of orange trees. Flock. You like that? And as I went by, guess what? I went, oh, that's amazing. I wanted to go in and say, can I pick all those and put them in my car? Or that, you know. Did you know nobody had to tell those trees to do that? Because that was a natural thing. Because they were healthy. Because they were being taken care of. Listen, if you're taking care of your spiritual life, if you really put your faith in Christ, the aroma of your life, the fruit of your life becomes natural. You don't have to put it on. That doesn't mean you don't need discipline sometimes. It doesn't mean you don't have to work on something. It doesn't mean that you don't have to let God prune you. But it means that you're even surprised sometimes that God has made you more loving in a certain situation where you used to really struggle. You see, that person's considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Notice the faith comes first. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. I'll come back to that in a second. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, time out. James is the first one that writes about Rahab. Later, Matthew writes about her and puts her in the line of Jesus. She is in the line of Christ. She was a prostitute who did what God called her to do, where she could have easily gotten killed. She put her faith out there and acted upon her faith in God. And it changed not only her life, but her entire family. And James is one of her family members. This was his great, 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 you keep going, grandmother. So imagine saying this sentence about your great, great grandmother. Even grandma the prostitute. Do you, do you realize, we, we don't think about it that way, but he's talking about a family member. And he says, listen, this person in my family who was far from God changed the entire trajectory of our family because she trusted God. Can I tell you something that you can do? When you trust God and you do what God's called you to do, it's not just trusting him, but being obedient to him. When you do that, guess what? You can change the entire trajectory of your family. James is looking back and saying, look what she did. That family member of mine, I'm here today because of what she did. I would not even be Jewish if it was not for what she did today. Rahab. I want to show you this guy named Charles Blondin. This guy was a tightrope walker, crazy, in the 1800s. Mark Twain hated him. <laughs> Mark Twain thought he was an idiot, just so you know. Not, not that Mark Twain was ever opinionated. Mark Twain's the one that said, when, when you have a teenager, when they turn 12, you, ta you take them in a field, you put them in a barrel, and you feed them through the hole. And when they turn 18, you plug the hole. <laughs> that was Mark Twain. So he had some strong opinions. So this guy, Blondin, was known for crazy stuff way before crazy stuff was seen. And he was one of these guys that purposefully loved it when people betted that he die, would die. And he would do things just to hear the crowd go, Ooh! So he did this line uh, uh, over Niagara, and he walked, uh, I forgot how, I think it was like 800 times he would do this. And he started learning that he could act like he was going to fall and grab the wire. And people would freak out, and then he could pull himself back up. He one time took a stove out to the middle and cooked an egg and brought it back and fed somebody. In this picture, this is his manager. He went across and his manager was over there and he said to him, get on my back. I guess the manager was getting a lot of money. So guess what? He got on his back. And he told him, he said, now listen, you've got to become one with me. If you sway the opposite way I sway, we're both going to die. Boy, that would encourage you, wouldn't it? My favorite story about him is this one. He used to walk a wheelbarrow back and forth on this same thing. He was used to it. It wasn't even a big deal to him. And one day he walked the wheelbarrow across and some reporter was there and said, Oh, you are phenomenal. You are the most amazing man in the world. I think you're great. And Blondin said, Oh, so do you trust me? And the guy said, Oh, yeah, I trust you. And Blondin said, Okay, get in the wheelbarrow. 
And the guy said, oh, no, 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 don't trust you that much. Make sure that your faith in Christ is not just a mental assent to Jesus, I trust you, but you're willing to get in the wheelbarrow. See, faith is not just knowing about the chair. That's not faith. That's knowledge, but then it becomes faith when I trust him. Do you really trust Christ? Listen to what it says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. What does that mean? You're trusting him. You're getting in the wheelbarrow. And it's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that only those who do a lot of work can boast. No, so no one can boast. So that means when you're serving at the church and you start thinking, you know, I'm the only one around here that does anything. Nobody else serves the way I do. No, instead, we should be going, God, you know what? If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't even be doing this. You know what, God? If it wasn't for you, I, I wouldn't even want to do this. God, I'm not doing this because other people are doing it. I'm doing it because you've called me to do it, and I'm just going to keep doing it till you tell me to quit doing it. No one can boast. You can't get prideful. You can't get arrogant. You can't start thinking, well, I'm the pastor. Nobody else acts like me. I don't know any other pastor has to set up a sign on the street on Sunday morning. I had to set up a sign on the street. I'm suffering for Jesus. Somebody wrote me a mean note and said, Pastor, if you talk about that again, I'm leaving the church. I don't want to hear any more about that. I'm so persecuted. I got a letter. Do you hear how we do? You've done it. Come on, you've done it. I remember people setting up chairs at the community center, and they'd always come to me, nobody sets up chairs but me. I'm like, then quit setting them up. And they're like, well, no, I was looking for you to sell me everybody else was bad. No, they're not. Quit doing it. People will find a place to sit. We'll sit on the floor. I don't care. Every once in a while, somebody will call me and say, we don't have a sound person today. I go, okay, don't, don't bring them. What? I don't care. I, there, was, there was church way before there was sound, and I'm plenty loud. Yeah, you might want to volunteer because that might happen one week. All right, so, <clears throat> for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, listen, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has a work for you. He made you as a work. He's given you gifts, and he wants to use you. So let me ask you this final question today. Listen, are you real? Are you fake? I sat in church for years and pretended to be a Christian. And one day I realized that I knew all about the chair, but I had never trusted Jesus. And I was baptized as a kid because my parents wanted me to, and I felt the pressure of it. And then as an adult, after I gave my life to Christ, as a college student, in front of kids I was leading, I went out into a lake and was baptized in front of, a ki in front of kids I had led for three years. And said, I've never been baptized as a Christian. Why? I knew about the chair but in my last year of high school, I trusted in Jesus. Do you want to trust in Christ today? You can do that today. If you've never surrendered your life to him, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. I'd love to pray with you. The prayer doesn't save you. It's what happens in your heart. It's not the prayer that says, there's nowhere in the Bible that says pray a prayer. It says put your faith in Christ. We express that through a prayer. But if you want to surrender your life to him, knowing that Jesus died and rose again, you can do that today. Maybe as a Christian, the truth is you've got some fake limbs in your life and you just need to be honest and say, oh God, you're going to work on that area. I trust you. Maybe you're feeling topsy-turvy today, like life is out of control. I want to encourage you just to say, God, even in this, I don't understand you, but I trust you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your grace. Lord, even when we blow it, even when we mess up, even when we don't put our trust in you sometimes, you bring us home. So, Lord, we choose to trust you today. Lord, any area of our life where we don't trust you, Lord, give us the power through your spirit to trust you. Thank you that it is by grace that we're saved. Not because we've done anything, not because we've earned it, but because you absolutely love us. Help us to be so full of that love that it overflows. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here or anyone watching online that doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender their heart and their life to you. Change us, Lord, each day. In Jesus' name, amen.